<laughs> Very good. All right. Well, the room should all be closing up. And please join me in giving a big e-welcome to our guest, uh, Professor Nessifer from the University of Arizona. And I will let our first student introducer, uh, Leif Everson, give the official introduction. But um, please, if you came up with something great in your breakout room, throw it up in the chat and we can talk about it towards the end. But otherwise, please join me in welcoming Professor Nessifer. All right, Leif, it's all yours. Sounds good. Well, welcome, Dr. Nesfer. Um, so, hello, everyone. My name is Leif Everson, and uh, I'm honored to introduce you to today's speaker, Dr. Len Nesfer. A quick Google search of Dr. Nesfer reveals an incredibly diverse set of skills, hobbies, work experience, and projects far beyond the reach of most individuals. I first became aware of Dr. Nesifer last year when he was featured in episode 17 of The 50 Project, a YouTube series following pro skier Cody Townsend as he attempts to hike and ski the 50 classic lines of North America. Dr. Nesifer joined Cody to climb Mount Tukunikovitz um, in Utah's LaSalle mountain range. Hopefully I didn't murder that. Um, the LaSalle range is the ancestral homelands of the Ute, Navajo, and Puebloan people. I was quickly captivated by Dr. Nesifer, a proud member of the Navajo Nation, as he offered a perspective on indigenous communities and the outdoors that I had never fully considered. I'm always enthralled by the 50 Project, but something about this particular episode stuck with me. When I saw Dr. Nesifer's name on the list of speakers for our class, I was not only ecstatic that we would get to hear his thoughts directly, but even more so, I was honored at the opportunity to introduce him, so hopefully I don't mess this up. Dr. Nesifer received a Bachelor of Science in Mechanical Engineering from the University of Kansas and a doctorate from Carnegie Mellon University's Department of Engineering and Public Policy. He worked at the NASA Glenn Research Center in Cleveland, Ohio on supersonic vehicle research before taking part in the Department of Energy's Office of Indian Energy Policy. He is currently a professor of Indian Studies and Public Policy at the University of Arizona. Beyond his work in the classroom, Dr. Nesifer is an avid outdoorsman. His love for the outdoors has trickled into the business world as he is the CEO of Natives Outdoors, an outdoor product and media company directly supporting indigenous people. The more I started to learn about Dr. Nesifer, the more I noticed his ability to meld the things he is passionate about with his hobbies to incite meaningful discussion and change. He uses skiing, climbing, mountaineering, bikepacking, and more as a means to convey stories of environmental activism and in indigenous history. He has documented these stories through his writing and photography, which have been featured in The Alpinist, Outside Magazine, The Climbing, Mag the Climbing Zone, Beside Magazine, Patagonia is the Cleanest Line, and various film festivals. His film, Welcome to Gwicha Z, showcases the Gwich'in people's fight to protect their lands from oil and gas development. The film highlights the stake if another native community's concerns are pushed aside for commercial interest. Once again, Dr. Nesifer's ability to combine multiple disciplines shines through in the film and captivates the audience to learn more and stand up for the Gwich'in. Dr. Nesifer is at the forefront of an incredibly important movement to diversify the outdoors. His work is creating meaningful discussions about what it means to experience the outdoors, who gets to experience the outdoors, and why there needs to be a greater effort to increase representation of Native American people in recreation and conservation. I'm sure I could go on for hours of the importance of his work, but without further ado, it is my honor and privilege to introduce you to Dr. Len Nesifer. Right on. Thanks, Leif. I'm glad you enjoyed that episode. It was, uh, I'm sure you all watched it, but it was, Really fun day. I was really dehydrated, so it was kind of a, it was kind of a rough one. But uh, I skied down, which mattered, and it was incredibly beautiful. Yeah, it was amazing. Yeah, it's a cool and yeah, it, it's Tuki Vinivats, I think, is what it's called. Tuki Vinivats, yeah. or something like I don't know. We we were we were debating the entire way up what what it was. Um, yeah, I tried to go off Cody's uh, pronunciation, but I don't think he had it right either. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, so in uh, in it, we don't we don't actually know the name origin of the name, but there's a Russian uh, orchestra composer guy from New York in the 1800s that has shared the same name. So we think it might be something related. But um, great, everyone! Thanks for that. I had a little bit of an emergency with that water main break this morning, but all's good. 
Um, yeah, I'm really excited to be here. I'm going to give you a lecture that I give um, about Bears Ears uh, prior to um, leaving my job from the department. Well, actually, I left my job from the Department of Energy in haste because of what was happening around Bears Ears and Arctic National Wildlife Refuge. Um, basically, the change of administration meant to change of policy and that basically meant more extractive resource development and that was um, from the work that I had done directly in communities, there's been some pretty serious impacts from uranium mining on the Navajo Nation to coal power generation across the West. I mean, basically it's gone done, been done in the backyards of many native peoples. And so I grew up um, with a grandfather who was a uranium miner and um, he lost his entire left lung to silicosis because uh, workers weren't given proper breathing protection. Those mines were eventually abandoned at the end of the Cold War. Um, so I, yeah, my grandfather had a thing called his tail that he basically carried around and that was his portable oxygen tank. And um, I also grew up uh, next to a coal power plant and every winter I would get bronchitis and I thought um, that was getting a cold. <laughs> and soon I realized once I went off to college that that was not the case. And so, you know, m a lot of my work has been centered around just ensuring that native people have a voice at and seat at the table and that these sorts of developments can be done in a way that um, is more equitable than what's been happening in the past. So, um, but yeah, so Bears Ears was significant because it is a, a an instance of where indigenous people and um, non-indigenous communities have worked together for larger landscape protection, which is pretty significant in the scheme of public lands history. So let's jump into it. Um, this is, uh, let's see if we can get it this way. This is, uh, this is kind of an aside, we were talking a little bit about snow, but I, I kind of mentioned a little bit about Natives Outdoors. These are two of our athletes, McKaylee Oliver, who's Blackfoot. She was a uh, avalanche forecaster for the Colorado Avalanche Information Center. We've worked with her quite a lot on ski films. On the left is Aaron Mike, who's Navajo. He's, uh, he's actually a pretty strong climber, professional climber. He climbs 514, which is pretty hard climbing. Um, but he learned how to ski because in part he was a very avid rollerblader. So we were out kind of doing our snow thing last winter. Um, but this is a lot of the work that we do at Natives Outdoors, a lot of media and storytelling, but basically going into landscapes and, and just, just kind of giving a different lens on what's happened. So we, you know, at, with any sort of backcountry adventure, you, you have to, in the snow, you have to assess the snowpack stability. And that's what we were doing here. Each of those lines represents a different layer corresponding to a different snowstorm. Um, but basically avalanches are the big thing you have to worry about and they fail at those, those interface layers. So we were testing that stability. Um, this video didn't show, but it's called the Rouge Block Test. Basically Connor jumped over to the right and like dislodged basically the entire snowpack. So we decided to keep it low angle um, that day. And Connor is kind of known for throwing himself off cliffs and stuff. So. Um, but, you know, for a lot of, you know, in thinking about indigenous people, you know, one of the things that we like to do is breaking stereotypes and kind of showing that, like, um, you know, we are very tied to these landscapes, you know, athletics and, and movement through landscapes have been tied into our ways of being for millennia. So why not adapt it to these new sports? Um, but taking a step back about why, you know, how Natives Outdoors and all of that happened, I mean, at the end of the day, really this came for me and this start started around Bears Ears. Um, uh, and I'm sure some of you might have touched a little bit on this, but Bears Ears is potentially will be or was potentially will be the largest national monument in um, U.S. history. Um, I believe it was a little over, it was close to 2 million acres, if I last remember. Um, but what made this area so significant is that it's, it's, uh, it's, there's about 100,000 known archaeological sites dating back at least 13,000 years in the region. Um, and when you look at the Bears Ears in total, basically it's, it's, uh, it, bas it has more archaeological sites than all of the national park units combined. Um, anywhere else in the world, this place would be protected. Um, and, um, but one of the things that lies under the soil is there's oil and gas and uranium and other sorts of energy resources um, that this administration is very keen on developing. So um, we'll take, you know, I'm sure it sounds like many of you are pretty well versed in a lot of this stuff, but I'll, I'll kind of 
briefly talk about these things in the beginning because I assume you know these, but I think where I'll go into a little bit more depth is just kind of the um, on the ground and convergence that happened um, right before. Um, as we know, you know, the West is covered in public lands. Um, these are federally managed lands. Um, I think the important thing to note is that this does not include reservation lands, but technically speaking, um, federal Indian trust lands are a form of federal lands that are managed on behalf of Indian people and for the benefit of Indian people. The argument can be made that that hasn't necessarily been the case. Um, but there's a book that I've been referencing quite a bit called Dispossessing the Wilderness called by Mike David, Mark David Spence. It's his doctoral thesis, but it looks at the creation of the, basically the creation of the federal land system and um, American Indian reservations. And the argument that he makes is that there had, in, in, in the course of Indian removal, federal lands and reservation systems had to coincide. Um, Black Elk, a leader for the Lakota, said that they had to make, a, uh, they had to make parks for the four-leggeds and parks for the two-leggeds. And so we see that this, you know, many of these ancestral homelands that uh, many tribes call home are basically bordering reservations. Um, you know, this is the broader breakdown. Again, the big thing to remember here is that this doesn't include reservation land, um, but it is a huge component of federally managed lands and tribe and lands that tribes still manage today. Um, <clears throat> uh, I'm sure you talked a little bit about the Antiquities Act, but I think one of the things I'd like to highlight here is, you know, in the early 20th century, and um, in the settlement of the region around Bears Ears, there was actually quite a bit of looting and vandalism of these areas. There was a big push to, in the private uh, museum market to um, acquire Indian artifacts because at, during this time, um, in the late 1800s, this had come sort of like following the Civil War, there was some pretty significant waves of genocidal violence. Um, in the creation, for example, in the creation of California, the first civilian, civilian governor, um, Bennett, ran on the platform of basically Indian genocide. Um, and uh, what followed in much of the plains and much of the West was um, one, like the forced removal and internment of my people leading to potentially somewhere around 30, 40% of our population dying. But this was also true for many of the tribes across the West. And um, there was this belief at that time in the early 1900s that native peoples were going to go extinct. And so in order to um, preserve some of this history and also to um, potentially expedite some of these processes, the Antiquities Act came into play. This is, you know, in, in some views of, of native scholars, this is part of the reasons of the Antiquity Act is coming out of that time. Um, but one of the things that it, you know, as we know, it basically took some of the power of Congress, gave it to the executive and allowed hopefully a much more uh, expedient protection of lands that were under threat. Um, <clears throat> so uh, Bears Lodge, Devil's Tower was the first of these and there was many that followed. Um, one of the things that I really wanna highlight though is there's, there's this, inseparability of um, basically the, the understanding that native peoples were inferior and also going to go extinct. And, um, you know, we can look at this through the quotes of Teddy Roosevelt and John Muir and what they believed. But in many ways, if you look at what the purpose of the Antiquities Act was, is that it was not meant for tribes to use it for their own benefit. Um, I actually think that Teddy Roosevelt would probably turn in his grave figuring out what happened around Bears years. <laughs> Um, right in my backyard, you know, I always like to reference in, with my students in my class, but, you know, uh, the Saguaro National Park, which um, actually has two units on both sides of Tucson, um, started as a national monument in the 30s, um, and, it, and it's since turned into a national park. So there's kind of this, there can be this trend of basically this initial designation that can lead to higher levels of production on the road. Um, <clears throat> so the Bears Ears, you know, I, this is, uh, I, I think one of the misconceptions about the Bears Ears is that it's just these two buttes. Uh, this is right on top of a place called Cedar Mesa. Um, but uh, this is actually one of the coolest, I think in my, my opinion, it's one of the nicer areas because it's a little bit cooler, especially this time of year. But it, it also speaks to the advanced civilizations that were living on this plateau um, around 13 to, or uh, 1100 to 1400 AD. Um, 
but the important thing to know about this mesa top is that there's no um, year-round water source except for runoff from snowmelt on the Bears Deers and the Abajos, the mountain range that's just to the north, and then also the monsoon rains. But the ancestral Puebloan people that call this place home were able to establish large cities, extensive trade networks that that span down into Mexico. They were they were bringing up live parrots from Mexico and using them from ceremonies and using chocolate and like. But they were also doing it basically not having a steady supply of water. However, what happened though around 1300, 1350 is that there was a once in a millennia drought that um, basically forced a lot of these outlying settlements to be abandoned. Um, my people, the Navajo, moved into this region around that time. Um, and one of the things that we eventually we came in upon was a lot of chaos. I mean, it was effectively climate chaos that was occurring here. Um, but many of these sites that the, these, the ancestral Puebloan people lived in, um, they left them as if they were to come back. They left them basically intact with food, with artifacts, with, you know, all of the uh, keepings of, an, of a normal home. Um, the settlement by the Mormons in the 17, 1870s actually was led by um, a lot of looting of these sites as well. So I'll get into that a little bit more. Um, yeah, so I mentioned this a little bit, but, you know, there's been multiple cultures here, of course, the ancestral Puebloans, but the Utes and the Paiutes have a long history here. They were much more nomadic, and they just had basically a different social structure than the, the Pueblos. Um, but uh, an important thing to note is that you can walk basically anywhere in this area, and you will find evidence of human occupation. It's pretty amazing. Um, I highly recommend going. Um, I also highly recommend learning about how to minimize the impact in these areas. Um, but it's an incredibly beautiful place. And I think it's one of the amazing, it's one of the, I would say, one of the um, hidden gems of the West. Um, but as I mentioned before, artifact that became much more of an issue. Um, early Mormon settlers were paid by museums to collect these artifacts. Um, you even saw, even as recently into the 1990s, that the local Boy Scout, Scout troops would get um, pot hunting badges, merit badges, for basically collecting artifacts. And these would often be recreational outings for families. Um, unfortunately, some of these outings actually turned into literal grave robbing. Um, and so they, for many tribes in the area, this became a frustration because, as you can imagine, uh, it's probably not in good form for me as a native person to go be to go dig up Arlington National Cemetery, but for a lot of native folks, this is what was being seen as what was happening. Um, I'd like to highlight these photos on here are ones I've taken of the time I've spent out here. So this is, these are intact pots and things that you can find out in Bears Ears still. Granted, this one is really far out there, uh, and it's really hard to get to, and I will never tell you where it's where it is, but. The, the important thing to note is that this had been, these tensions had been brewing for close to a hundred, a century. Um, back in 2009, there was, it's the large, it's known, Cer Operation Cerberus Action was known as the largest um, uh, archaeological sting or bust in, in U.S. history. But in the town of Blanding, there was, uh, I believe, 16 families and um, 40, 40, 40 people, 24 people were indicted, but there was about another 40 that were involved. But basically, um, folks were still collecting and selling artifacts on the black market. And um, there's a number of federal laws that protect um, Indian graves and other sorts of artifacts on federal public lands. Um, NAGPRA, the Native American Graves Protection and Repatriation Act is one, um, and there's others as well. But um, this was a major, major um, bust that happened in Blanding, Utah. And I think the important thing to under, uh, underline on this particular issue is that Bears Ears, in many ways, is a race is it is an issue of race. It's a race issue at its core between natives and and the Mormon white Mormon community in the area. There's a lot of animosity. There's a lot of racism. Um, personally, as an Navajo person, I don't like to go to Blanding because I've been pulled over like three of the last six times I've drove from, driven through. Um, but, you know, it's kind of been this, prox the Bears Ears have been this proxy battle between the control of the region, either by Native people or by the non-Native communities in the area. 
But this particular bust was particularly um, soured the waters quite a bit. One of the doctors actually committed suicide in following that. So it's, it's been, it's still something that's talked about today and it's still a sore point. But an important thing to note about this particular incident is that there was close to 40,000 archeological artifacts recovered and, and there's still to this day a, um, a warehouse in Salt Lake City that stores most of them. Um, figuring out what to do. So it's a, it's a lot of money, it's a lot of uh, resources, a lot of history. So <clears throat> there's been talk by a number of the tribes about protecting this region. Um, there's There was one, um, I believe Bobby Kennedy, when he was uh, running for president, came out and there was a Navajo woman that said, basically said the bear's ears need to be protected. This has been an issue that's been on, you know, basically on the minds of a lot of Navajos and other people, uh, the other native folks in the areas for quite a long time. Um, but this got a lot of momentum um, beginning in 2011. Um, and the, the number, the five tribes that uh, basically make the, up the bear's ears intertribal coalition came together and um, decided to create this uh, tribal sovereignty proxy. Basically, the Bears Ears Intertribal Coalition can represent um, these five tribes in a, in a very leal, real legal capacity uh, in, in issues surrounding its negotiation. Um, an important thing I want to highlight, though, is that, um, you know, in the case of the Navajo and the Ute, um, we've been sworn enemies for quite a long time. The Ute were... Um, helped in our removal and um, uh, basically forcing us to be placed in an internment camp in the 1860s. Um, there's also a long and tumultuous history around Indian slavery. Um, there's a book that I'm reading now called The, the Other Slavery, um, but it talks about basically the Ute would steal Indian Navajo kids and sell them to the Spanish. So there, you can imagine that there's not a lot of good blood. But uh, the point being is that, you know, the idea, the understanding among these five tribes is that if they worked separately towards the protection of this area, that they would all fail. But if they worked together, they had a chance in um, protecting the Bears Ears region. And so they began looking at leveraging the Antiquities Act to do this. <clears throat> An important note that I want to highlight on this, though, is that um, Early on, Sally Jewell, who was the Secretary of Interior at the time, basically said that it needs to encompass much more than just tribes in order for the administration to move forward with the protection of this region. And one of the groups that was uh, very consequential was climbers. Um, there is a uh, University of Colorado professor named Charles Wilkinson. Um, and uh, oddly, you know, kind of serendipitous, seren it was serendipitous that one of his, uh, his mentees was a climber. And she was talking about the Bears Ears and Indian Creek and this, you know, world renowned climbing area. And Charles said, it would be really great if the tribes could talk to the climbers and vice versa. And so Charles actually facilitated some of the first meetings between the Access Fund, um, Brady Robinson. Um, who's the executive director and the intertribal coalition. But an important thing to note here is that there's a lot of tension among climbers and Navajo people. So this is the, this is the memo that kind of highlights that. Um, you know, the Navajo Nation has been a site for climbing for, or an, of interest of climbers for decades. And beginning in the 30s, I was around 1938, I think is when Shiprock, which is a large volcanic um, outcropping was first climbed. Um, but when, you know, the pop, with the increase in popularity also came in the increase in accidents. So there was a number of deaths that occurred and in Navajo worldview, it contaminates these sacred sites. So after I think about four or five deaths, the Navajo Nation stepped in um, about two months after uh, two folks died on Shiprock and basically said, there's no more climbing here. Um, and a lot of the climbing basically became these sort of clandestine climbing missions by rogue climbers. And a lot of instances, um, still to this day, this, this band still stands, but climbers were actually um, disobeying tribal law um, in, in many regards. And with, well, I mean, they effectively trespassing on, on the Navajo reservation. And it's, it's, I mean, quite frankly, it pissed off, it still pisses off a lot of Navajo people. Um, <clears throat> and this still holds today. Um, so this is kind of an interesting piece of history that really set the groundwork. But 
what really began to change that is that there was two native folks that were really involved with climbing at that time. One of these guys, Aaron Mike, who's the Native Lands Regional Coordinator for the Access Fund, and another man named Garen Kariz, who passed away a couple of years in a climbing accident. He was from the Tewa Pueblo. Um, but these two began facilitating these conversations between the climbers and between the tribes and their representatives. Um, and I believe it was something like uh, three of the five tribes uh, saw the value or basically were okay with climbing occurring within the Bears Ears and the two other representatives weren't. But they basically identified the importance of working together towards this larger goal. Um, <clears throat> and one of the important things to note is that um, uh, the Bears Ears Pro Proclamation was one of the first proclamations to directly reference the importance and value of recreation on these landscapes, in addition to the vast cultural and scientific resources that existed there. Um, so this is kind of what the, you see the climber on that wall there. Basically, this is, this is a place called Indian Creek, but it's well known for a type of um, very... Uh, how would I describe this? It's, it's slightly masochistic climbing. You're basically climbing up these long cracks. Um, it's incredibly painful, but there's people that love to do it. But <laughs> anyways, I'm not a fan, but uh, the Indian Creek is a well-known place that, you know, folks from all over the world will travel to. Um, but an important thing that was built there is that there was this understanding between the tribes and climbers that there had to be more education of climbers about the impacts of climbing on cultural resources and how climbers can be better stewards of these landscapes. Um, so really, I mean, I think one of the things that I'd like to highlight is that, um, you know, the election happened in 2016, of course, policy uh, motivations change, but in that policy opening, the state of Utah actually, um, moved, the state of Utah and the governor moved to, um, ask the Trump administration to rescind the Bears Ears National Monument. Um, I'm sure uh, uh, many of you are aware that what followed, was uh, a review of the 28 national monuments and basically making uh, recommendations for reductions or resizings. Um, so, sorry, 28, 27. Um, so these were, the, these were the monuments that were put into review. Um, the important thing to note is that the only two monuments that were, um, were reduced, uh, sorry, there was th the two major reductions were through the Bears Ears and Grand Staircase Escalante, which were effectively like neighboring monuments, and, and then the Cascade Sequoia. But it, that one was much, much more, uh, less significant in terms of the total size and the total reduction. So the reduction, um, uh, basically it was the total, the percentage reduction was about 85%. Um, the original monu monument designation was in green. Um, and the two, these are the two units that are left over from that. And um, that monument, the monument reduction was also applied to um, Grand Staircase, which is on the other side of Lake Powell. So fairly significant. And that also includes um, many of the, I'll show you some photos of some of the places that are now no longer have the National Monument Protection. Um, and this was the um, Grand Staircase. Let me take a drink of water real quick. Um, so, you know, I was at that time when this occurred, I was working, uh, well, right before it was signed, I had quit about a week before this happened. But at the time when I was at the Department of Energy, we were getting a lot of requests from the administration about scoping, um, uh, different sorts of resource potential underneath the ground, um, and basically what tribe's interest would be there. Um, and so... <laughs> I guess being on the inside, I, I knew that this, at the end of the day, this was all about expediting um, uh, oil and gas development and uranium development. Um, there, uh, yeah, so I mean, this came out in like March of 2018, surprise, surprise, like it was kind of like, well, well documented knowledge at that point. Um, but there was an interest in basically expediting that and, and monument protection would basically pr put a big uh, buffer into any sorts of developments that were, would occur. Um, this gives you a sense of the energy resource development that has occurred um, in the region and then also potential resources underneath the ground. Um, and in this part of Utah, it's, you know, 
uh, blending is, you know, Southeast Utah is relatively impoverished and there's this kind of um, uh, rhetoric that goes around that says basically that if we don't have energy development, we won't have jobs, but, you know, there's a lot of outdoor rec and industry potential in that region as well. So it's, it's complicated. I don't want to say that it doesn't result in, inter- you know, it's kind of like, like, what do you value? And I think it's, it definitely falls along the lines of uh, native and the non, not the white communities in the area just have very different values on what, what's important. So <clears throat> uh, there's a number of sites in the Bears Ears that require uh, rope climbing and climbing protection to get to. Um, this is one of them. And I think an important thing to note is that uh, I always wondered, it's like, well, how the hell did they get there, get here in 1200 AD? Um, but there's um, actually been more recent archaeological evidence highlighting that the um, Pueblo people used yucca root ropes and they were top belaying people into these areas. So they were actually using climbing techniques way back when. Um, but this area is now unprotected. This is no longer a part of the Bears Ears National Monument. And um, there's many sites like this. Um, this is Valley of the Gods, incredibly beautiful place. Uh, highly recommend going in winter. It's like really beautiful um, with the red rocks and the snow. Another cliff dwelling site requiring some climbing skill to get to. Um, and I think an important thing to note is that the reason why that these sites were built in this way is that this was right during sort of the latter end of the Pueblo and civilization in this area when society was falling apart. So people were trying to hide or hide food. Um, so these became defensive positions as well. Another site down in the canyons. Um, this is one of my favorites. It's actually, there's handprints all along the wall of families and people that lived in the valley or in these, in these areas. Um, the swirl sign is a reference to um, my, so my, one of my clans, I'm Navajo, but technically I'm probably Hopi. <laughs> and this, this particular symbol references our migration from our creation point to where we got today. Um, my ancestors basically made the transition from being Hopi to Navajo around 700 AD. There's this really cool story, of, well not cool story, but basically they were refugees when the other Hopis decided to burn down the Catholic missions and kill all the men in the village and so everyone fled. So that's when I became Navajo. But I think this is the, I think the point is, is that like a lot of these histories and identities in this area are complicated and for myself, you know, it's like I see the symbol and I know that's related to my particular clan. Again, another area. So, you know, having known that this was occurring and there was a lot of um, uh, support within the outdoor industry at that point, um, one of the things I want to highlight is that there was some real economic consequences for the state of Utah. So up until 2017, there was this thing called the Outdoor Retailer Trade Show. Um, you can see the numbers there in terms of total visitors and local spending, but this is in one week, you know, so this brings a lot of spending to the city of Utah or to Salt Lake into the state of Utah. Um, but what ended up, what began to happen is that a lot of the retailers like Patagonia, REI, North Face began pulling out of the show in protest of the show being held in the state of Utah. Um, and this forced the trade show organizer to rejigger, reconfigure. Um, and what they did is that they basically put the bid up <laughs> uh, to other states to hold this show, and they didn't allow the state of Utah to apply. In large part, this was because this was purely because of the state's stand, uh, stance on public lands. And as you can imagine, for the outdoor industry, public lands are a major backbone for the industry's um, vitality. Um, so at the time, um, I was working, um, I'm still on the advisory board for the Colorado, uh, uh, outdoor recreation industry advisory board. And so one of the things during this time is that we, uh, ha- we basically put a pitch in. And so we came up with this tagline about why we would make a better site than Utah. So, <clears throat> um, but, you know, I think this was a, it really pointed to the fact that with the state was also looking at how to change this dynamic between tribes and the outdoor industry as well. So we had this pitch, but the other part of this is that we said, in addition to holding the show, we will directly engage and partner with tribes on the outdoor industry issues. 
So at the first outdoor retailer show, we convened a meeting of about 30 tribes, including the five tribes of the Intertribal Coalition and bringing them together with outdoor industry leaders, Patagonia, North Face, REI, um, and then the state of Colorado. And basically we said, we wanna make this a durable partnership. We wanna make this something that lasts. And we also want to have this be a stalwart to any sorts of future monument reductions. Um, and in looking at the conflict that's occurred in the past, I basically looked at the European Union and you know the EU in large ways where it's created uh, to reduce conflict by economic integration. And I think especially on the issue of outdoor rec, like this could be a true dynamic that could occur between tribes and the outdoor industry. So we held this meeting, it was incredibly powerful. Um, uh, and we've actually held it, we did it last year uh, before the pandemic and we were supposed to do it again this year, but of course that didn't happen. Um, the other activist thing I was involved in was um, creating the Bears Ears Gorilla Visitor Education Center. So if you actually go to Bluff, Utah now, you can go and visit this place. But, you know, one of the things that we really recognized early on was that the Bears Ears was getting so much attention that um, more and more people were going to end up going and visiting this place. And since the there was not going to be any federal investment in education or other sorts of resources to minimize impact, we figured that we should do it on our own. So we went on this crazy campaign to raise uh, $750,000, which is what we raise now. This is a little out of date, but the outdoor industry pulled together um, and with partnerships with the Intertribal Coalition and the Friends of Cedar Mesa, it's now built. Um, this was a dumb thing that I did with some of my friends, but um, we basically, you know, in order to raise money for this, uh, a bunch of pro athletes um, myself, we ran, skied, climbed, um, I skied, um, and then we skied a total of 160,000 feet more or less in 24 hours. It was one of the hardest things I've ever done. Um, and it was early season, but we raised a uh, hundred thousand dollars. Um, basically people were pledging per foot of climbing. So it was pretty great. Um, but this was, you know, this was huge because it represented, um, you know, a lot of the education I was doing and working with these pro athletes was just simply giving them the language and understanding about why tribes mattered in the case of Bears Ears, why tribes had to lead this fight. Um, tribes as sovereign nations basically have a lot more um, leverage and forcing conversations and standing and suing in the case of the, the lawsuits that came out. Um, so right now there's uh, there's now two lawsuits um, that represents the Bears Ears National Monument and Grand Staircase. They're basically sitting in federal court, and the the tactics of the Bears Ears and the Tribal Coalition is to, to delay, with the hope that there's a new administration that comes in um, January twentieth. Um, but currently the administration has been pushing through a management plan for these two new units, and there's been a lot of opposition to this process as well. So. Um, you know, basically everything's kind of in a limbo around this as well. And, um, but one of the things that's really come out of this is that there's a greater understanding within the outdoor industry of the need to um, work with tribes as partners, because one of the things that came out of this is that tribes working as sovereign entities were able to leverage some of the largest conservation, the largest conservation gain um, in U.S. history. And, you know, I think working in um, there's a couple of angles that I look at that is that, you know, this is tribes also exerting their status as sovereign nations outside the bounds of reservations. Um, and so it was not a surprise to me to see that that was the first monument that was protected or that was reduced because it also meant that um, the path that tribes were going down to have these uh, have the Bears Ears basically be in this co-management regime uh, can no, well, we don't say it can no longer occur, but it's just not occurring right now. So um, but yeah, that's kind of like the broader scale of what's happening around the Bears Ears. And I'm working on a paper right now that will probably be published in the spring. Um, dynamics that led to that and like, you know, do, does this sort of alliance hold um, for issues in the future? And I think the sort of conclusions that I'm coming to is that it depends. But a big piece of that's really going to depend on whether how much the outdoor industry educates and tries to reduce the conflict among um, its user groups and tribes on public lands existing. So thank you so much, but I'm happy to chat about questions, but it looks like a few people have to run. Thank you so much. That was such an enlightening presentation and the pictures were amazing and the, the
the maps and everything really tied a lot of those pieces together really well. Um, I have two quick questions and then I would like to open it up to students first if there's anyone. I think we'll try and keep you for about 10, maybe 15 more minutes um, as people trickle out. And then, um, uh, so I'd like to give students an opportunity to go first. So is there anyone that would like to um, follow up on some of the issues that uh, Dr. Nesper brought up for us? Yeah, I have a question, just real quick. Please, Aaron, um, yeah. We, we've talked a lot in this class about the importance of language and revealing the values that people hold, hold towards the environment. Um, that being said, I, I noticed you used the term Indian a few times, and I was hoping you could talk about your perspective on that term and, yeah. and maybe language as a whole. Uh, yeah, I'm glad you highlighted that. Basically, like American Indian is a legal term that references American Indian, Alaska Native, um, is a term that you see in legal documents and otherwise. Um, Indian, yeah, I don't know. I use them interchangeably. I guess it doesn't, I, I should be a little bit more, like a little more careful with that. But yeah, I think it depends. But I think with the tribes, you know, generally if I'm talking about a specific tribe, I try to reference them uh, directly by name. Um, but, you know, I think the other, the other, so I studied a little bit about cultural differences and how they apply. I think especially around what's happening around Bears Ears, it's interesting to see the similarities and differences among the coalition of tribes and how they view things. Like, I think we as Navajos have much more of a easy predisposition to digging up the land and like developing coal resources as compared to say the Hopi. But I think the important thing to note there is that even among the five tribes, there's vast cultural, like vast cultural differences, um, like as significant as uh, white and non-native or native and white, for example. Um, so I guess that's an important thing is like there are elements of that that have a lot of overlap. And, and that was really key, um, at least in bringing on the climbers and the outdoor industry of just recognizing that there were shared values around the environment. And there was also a lot of differences around other things. I wasn't trying to call you out or anything. I was just genuinely curious about the, yeah. <laughs> no, it's okay. No, no, no. I just, I laugh about it because I, um, I, I, I actually had this question in my early class yesterday and I was just, I just thought it's funny. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I had a question about, um, so I guess, you know, talking about, empowering native groups and having those discussions because um, oftentimes their voices aren't heard. Um, the outdoor industry has been a great way for collaboration and meeting common goals. What other avenues do you think um, we should work on and, and promote for um, native communities moving forward? Like what areas, what industries could we start to see collaborate and make effective change? Um, you know, water issues and native peoples are pretty significant in the West. I don't know how much you'll talk about the winter's doctrine, but, you know, tribes are <laughs> kind of first in line, first and use first and right on a lot of this. And this has caused a lot of issues and given tribes an upper hand weirdly in a way. Um, but I think there's, especially as we look at climate change and the impacts there, I think there has to be a lot more collaboration on how we deal shortages like on the Colorado river and, um, you know, there's major cultural differences on, you know, basically the way our water use, our water rights are set up is that basically the environment and like the, the role of water in the environment doesn't have a fair use. It's basically industrial uses get the priority there. And I think like for many tribes, that's just like uh, a deal breaker, you know, because they're, in their view, it's like, well, the earth needs the water too. Um, <laughs> you know, I mean, like the Colorado River doesn't flow this Gulf of Mexico anymore, or the Sea of Cortez, um, and the con environmental consequences of that are pretty significant. And I don't think we fully understood what those are. And so I think, you know, examining those institutions and how they play out and the underlying values that are assumed there are really important. And just understanding that like different groups of people have different values when it comes to that. And I think that could apply to water. You know, renewable energy is another one of those, etc. Awesome, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, I had a question for you. Mm -hmm. 
I was just wondering if you think that photography and film are necessary and useful when it comes to alerting people to issues regarding public lands. Yeah, I mean, uh, I always say like the biggest, <laughs> the, the strongest hand the outdoor industry has is that they can take the most beautiful places of, you know, they can make Ohio look beautiful. No, no harm on Ohio. I lived there for a little while. But, you know, like there's a lot of power that visual imagery can convey. You know, I think about some of the earliest westward surveys, you know, uh, commissioned by Congress is that they would bring painters along to, to, you know, to basically paint these landscapes because they couldn't describe them in words. And I think that's descriptive of how powerful those things can be. Um, you know, the energy industry, for example, the uranium mining industry probably doesn't have a lot, you know, very big photo <laughs> photography scene going on. But, you know, it's kind of one of those interesting things to contrast and compare. And I think especially around um, the way I've been using photography and with Native people is like it's hard to, it's, it's, it's much easier to help folks understand why Native people hold certain areas to be sacred if there's photos or other sorts of visual representation or just simply going there and seeing what these places are like. Um, you know, across the board, Native people generally don't tend to live in very ugly places. And that's not by, <laughs> that's not by chance. Uh, so yeah, I would say that's like kind of key to that. And you saw with the ski video, like that was very key and central to like us describing why these areas were important to us. Thank you. Mm -hmm. um, you said in, the inter in this interview that we read um, that in the eyes of the Supreme Court, Native Americans and indigenous people are not viewed as a minority group or seen as a political class. Mm -hmm. Can you just talk a little more about, I guess, what that means in terms of like power and representation or? Yeah, I so one of the terms I've kind of always like and like have a little bit of an allergic reaction to is BIPOC by black indigenous people of color. And part of that is because like, while there are elements of our experience that are very much along the, that have similarities, like I think the important thing to note is that native people, as I mentioned, have a legal and political identity. And a lot of those are tied to treaties. So article six of the US constitution says treaties are a law of the land. Um, and, you know, up until from like the creation of the U.S., you know, you know, the United States up until 1871, the U.S. signed hundreds of treaties with Indian tribes, basically recognizing them initially as basically foreign nations. And eventually that became domestic dependent nations. Anyways, like part of our identity also is very legal and very political in the same way. Um, so we have treaty agreements, obligations and things that are due to us because of the violent dispossession of land. Um, and, uh, you know, I think in terms of lumping that experience in sort of the same category, that, that nuance gets lost. And especially around public lands issues, there's multiple federal laws, uh, executive orders, and all sorts of things that are directing Congress to uphold these treaty rights of tribes on public lands and like the need and duty for Congress or different agencies to consult with tribes on management. Um, NAGPRA um, is one that comes to mind. There's others that deal with hunting and fishing, but that one of the things I'd like to highlight is that it's not true of other minority groups, if I were to use that term, people of color. Um, but that's, that really highlights the importance of that political and legal context of Native people that relates to us coming from and being a part of the, quote, third sovereign of the United States, uh, Native nations. And so I think, especially when dealing with public land and representation and issues in the West, like, we have to be very specific about how we're talking about these things. I do think like um, a great example though, is that, you know, especially around police brutality, um, you know, native men my age are basically killed at the same rate uh, by police as African-American men. But, you know, we don't talk about that. <laughs> I mean, granted, we're like such a small part of the population. Uh, it becomes difficult, but, you know, especially in Western states, um, you know, a lot of the racism and antagonism against minority groups are often directed towards native peoples. So I think that's, you know, and there's a lot of tension around that, especially around reservations and all of that. Um, having spent a little bit of time in Utah and working with the Shoshone Bannock, I got to see some of that firsthand. It was, but I think the important thing to note is that, uh, you know, 
state law doesn't apply on Indian lands and there's other things like that that are really different. So I guess that to highlight, hopefully that clarifies a little bit, but it is different. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I have a follow up on that too, in reference to the maps that you put up with the public lands and you said a couple times that this doesn't include native land and native American land. And, and I just wanted to ask you if it should or how should it be perceived of? Because that does seem like a, a, a big hole when you see the West, you mm -hmm. see the federal land, right? And then there, there are the native lands and I come from a Latin American perspective in a place like Brazil, there is the incorporation of indigenous land in conservation mm -hmm. quotas, you know, or, you know, sort of totals. It's very much part of that. And I'm, and I'm just interested in your perspective of if, if, native land should be thought of in the same spectrum as public land and, and where in there, or, um, yeah, I'll, I'll yeah. there. <laughs> um, it's one of, I don't have, land um, is managed by the federal government for the benefit of native people. Like that, that's kind of what a reservation is. Um, granted, tribe, there's been a lot more movement tribes that have gained a lot of autonomy on how to manage these places. Um, but I think just looking from an ecosystem's perspective, like, you know, sage grouse don't really care if there's a reservation boundary or whatever. Uh, and so I think in terms of looking at, you know, Indian lands, Indian lands tend to be, um, in this country, have some of the least amount of environmental degradation. They actually don't have very, you know, the Navajo Nation has very few fences. It's basically open rangeland. And, you know, there's um, ecological consequences for that. I, I think, you know, part of my mind goes to, this is like unsubstantiated and maybe like partially my opinion, but like there has been a project to erase native people from landscapes. And it's very easy, like in putting up federal lands and saying, oh, this, you know, Indian land is not really that kind of continues that project. But I think, I, but I also think like at the same time, putting those two together creates a false equivalency that kind of misses that it's not, you know, it, it basically like trespass on Indian lands is something that is real for non-natives that aren't a part of that. So like there's, there's complications there and nuances that have to be sussed out. But um, I think in terms of larger conservation, larger landscape management, it really matters in like thinking about both and all of the, you know, federal lands and reservation lands as well. Wonderful, thank you. Do we have one more question? Um, yes, can I ask a question? Yes, please, Jessica, go ahead. Um, so I know this was talked about a little bit and I may have missed it, but what would you like to see from like outdoor recreation industry? Uh, one of the things I'm working with, I mean, uh, well, I mean, I think I'd like to see more native people in the industry. Um, uh, something like 92% of national parks are within 100 miles of a reservation. And you look at most reservations, not all, I want to highlight that it's, there's some reservations that are doing quite well. And I'm happy to point you to some. <laughs> there's one tribe, for example, side, total side note, um, the Agua Caliente Banacuya Indians owns 40% of the real estate under uh, Palm Springs. And they're a multi-billion dollar tribe and like the whole nother thing. You can go on a Google search if you want. But there's multiple tribes that have that reality. Um, but there's a lot, especially if you look in more rural parts of the United States where tribes are generally tend to be, um, there's a lot more rural poverty. And, you know, the outdoor industry, while not perfect and while having its issues, also allows one of the few opportunities for Native folks to live and work in their own home community. Um, brain drain is a big issue, especially around providing education. You know, uh, the sort of trends show that if you educate women in the community they generally tend to stick around and, and tend to leave and so that becomes you know I always kind of have that in the back of my mind and thinking about and building an outdoor rack economy is that a consent it could further those those trends as well so I think there has to be a little bit of nuance and a little bit of thought put behind how do you do this in a sustainable way but I think at the end of the day there's an opportunity to address the economic issues the health disparities and then also um, allowing Native peoples to kind of connect, connect with their landscapes in ways that we've done for quite a long time. Wonderful. Well, um, thank you so much for your time this morning, despite the interruption. And we're so grateful that you were able to talk with us and answer some of the questions. Thank you, students, for also giving some really great questions. And this
so spicy in some of the issues we've already addressed. We read last week a, a chapter that looks at the Civil Rights Act and the Wilderness Act side by side, right? And sort of the dissonance between those two trajectories. And I see a lot of your work is bringing those different strands together, right? Whether it's the outdoor industry and energy development or native rights. And it's such a valuable perspective for this class and for all of our students. We're so grateful for that. Um, uh, so thanks. If yeah. there's anything else that, that you'd like to tell us, otherwise I think we'll sign off and um, and Mackenzie and I will be in touch with the, with the further pieces for this class. Kind of great. Forward. Awesome. That sounds great. But thank you all. I appreciate it. Thanks for going a little over. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you.